Before we get into the message this morning, uh, just a reminder, we have about 50 people that would normally be here on Sunday morning that are not because they're out at the men's retreat at Top of the World. So I have a feeling starting next week, though, it's going to be pretty crowded again here at the Oasis. So enjoy this Sunday. This is sort of the calm before the storm. Uh, I think throughout the month of April with our grand opening and ninth anniversary next Sunday, and we'll talk more about that with you at the end of the service, and then Easter Sunday's the third Sunday of April, and then we're going to have that special message on the last Sunday that we're going to have pretty, pretty, good, pretty good turnouts uh, throughout the month of April. But it's good to see all of you and to have you all here today, and we're going to continue our series in the book of First Peter, and we're going to be in First Peter chapter 4 this morning. First Peter chapter 4. By the way, if you can just sort of turn your, turn, no, not turn, tune, tune your ear out this, this whole nasally, allergy, <laughs> terrible sounding voice today. I'm hoping that you hear God anyway and not Jeff Royce, okay? And I, I could have come out here today and I could have said, ah, I'm just going to say my voice and I'm not going to worship. I can't do that. I come out here, I want to sing out, I want to worship just as much as you do. So, you know, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to sing out and if, if God wants my voice to be a little gravelly during the message, that's okay, you know. It's about the working of the Holy Spirit here anyway. Hey, but before we actually get into Peter's words this morning, I want to say this. We know that Peter failed the Lord, okay? We, we know that. But here's a deal about Peter that can be an encouragement to us. I, I think the words that Peter shares with us today shows that there, there was moments where he learned from his mistakes, <laughs> where he grew from the things that, that, you know, he didn't do so well at it at one time in his life. And I think that's what God wants to see in our lives. It's not that we're not going to fail at times. It's not that we're not going to fall down at times. But it's, can we, with the Lord, can we pick ourselves back up? And can we learn something from that experience? Can we take something from that experience that will help us be better be able to even help others better as we move forward in this life. And I think that was the case with Peter for this reason. You remember that scene, the night on which Jesus was betrayed, where he's trying to get his followers to watch and pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're like checking out, they're too tired, they, they, you know, they, they don't want to keep up. And he's like, guys, you don't understand what's coming. And, and if, you, if you don't prepare yourselves and you don't ready yourselves for what's coming, this season is going to run you over because it's not going to be easy because Jesus knew his crucifixion was coming and all the suffering and even all the persecution that was going to come down on the early church that we find out about in the book of Acts. And he needed these men and these women to be ready and to be strong, but they just didn't seem to get it. And we know what happened. You know, Peter was like declaring how he was so ready and he would never deny the Lord and everybody else could turn their back on God, but not him. And we know how miserably he failed. Because Jesus said, before the cock crows three times, you will deny me. And he did. He fell flat on his face. So Peter comes to us now, God's people, And we know that he's talking to people who are going through hardships and trials and persecution now. That's who he was writing to. And he's saying to all of us, you got to be ready because there's going to be a season in your life. There's going to be seasons of our lives. It's going to be hard. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to try to say everything's going to be okay when everything's not going to be okay. Because if we say those things over and over again, then it doesn't prepare us. It doesn't ready us. It doesn't strengthen us for the days we're really going to need that strength. And we're really going to need to be prepared and ready. So that's why Peter shares what he does. He doesn't want us to make the same mistake that he and the other disciples did in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus knew what was coming and he wanted to try to prepare them and they weren't really buying into it. Because Peter here is talking to a group who's already suffering, who's already going through pain and heart, and he's saying it's going to get ratcheted up even a little bit more, so I need to share a few things with you 
in order to prepare you to be a victor and not a victim. To be able to live victoriously in this life, no matter what your circumstances, no matter what your situation. And folks, that is a message that we as the church truly need to hear and we need to embrace today because we live in a world of victims. We, we live in a world where everybody's a victim of their circumstances and of their situation, and they basically have allowed life and whatever life has, has brought to them to rule over them and define them rather than them to rise above their circumstances and situations and to sit above it. And God wants his people always to be able to be in a position, regardless of what we go through, to get on top of our circumstances and not allow our circumstances to define or rule us. So in order to do that, first of all, Peter says this to his readers, beginning in 1 Peter 4.1, be prepared to suffer. Notice what he says in verse 1. So, since Christ suffered in the flesh, let's stop there. He's reminding us, listen, our own Savior, our own Lord, Jesus, suffered. And Jesus over and over again told his followers, how do you expect to escape from the same fate that I went through? How do you as the servant expect to do any different than the master? If I have went through these things, then you will go through these things too. In fact, in chapter uh, 3, verse 18, Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Over and over again, the Bible talks about the sufferings of Christ. In fact, even in chapter 4, verse 13, a verse we're going to look at a little bit later and more closely, he says, rejoice in the degree that you've shared in the sufferings of Christ. It, it is part of... Of, of our DNA, if you will, as a Christian, that we are going to suffer. And so we've got to adopt then a proper mindset, which is why then he says, you also then arm yourselves with the same attitude. The word arm is an interesting word. It's actually a military word. It's a word that means to be prepared or ready for battle. See, something that you and I forget is that sometimes as Christians, we think maybe Christ has called us to, to vacation. <laughs> no, Christ has called us as his followers to the battlefield as warriors. And unless you and I come at life with the mindset that we must arm ourselves and our mind with the idea that suffering and hardship and pain and persecution and all of these things are going to be part of it, then we are not going to live victoriously. We're going to become a victim. Amen. Because anytime something bad happens to us or someone else, we will be filled with despair and disillusionment because, you know, in our theology, if you will, Christ followers shouldn't have to suffer. Even though the Bible says, if Christ suffered in the flesh, you and I need to arm ourselves with the same attitude, you see. Instead of being surprised when we suffer, we actually be some more surprised when we're not going through a season of suffering of some kind, you see. And then he goes on to say this, because the one who has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin, now that, that does not mean that when you and I physically go through suffering that somehow we become sinless. What it does mean is this. A commitment to Christ that results in suffering. In other words, I'm not going to go the route of most people, which is always defaulting to self-preservation. <laughs> That, that I'm going to commit myself to follow Christ to the point where even if it means suffering for me, then that reveals a passion for a new way of living life, Amen. for a new way of approaching life. See, and that's what many Christians down through history, they had to make that choice. Am, am I going to back off from being a real devoted, energetic, enthusiastic follower of Christ in order to save myself? A little pain, a little, you know, suffering, a, a little persecution? Or am I going to continue to follow hard after Christ no matter what comes at me? And Peter is simply saying, when you and I as Christians have gotten to a commitment level 
where we are committed to being followers of Jesus Christ, no matter what that means for us, then that means we have embraced this new way of living life, as Jesus talks about, an abundant life, that in spite of maybe the hardships and pain and suffering, I'm going to be so fulfilled and so satisfied in my relationship with God and walking with God and being used by God as his instrument, no matter what the circumstances, that I am totally absorbed in that that it doesn't matter then what kind of suffering, if you will, I go through because I have armed my mind. It has started in my way of thinking, and that's really always the battlefield for us is everything about our lives starts with our mind and thinking, which is why the Bible talks to us so much about our attitude up here in our heads and our minds and why we've got to clear our thinking and make sure that we are thinking from things from a biblical God perspective. Because so often when suffering comes, if, if our mindset has not been sort of uh, registered correctly and, and, and calculated correctly, when things happen to us, then our minds and our thoughts starts to, to drift off in really bad, dark places, and we become victims very quickly to our circumstances rather than growing to be victors. Be prepared to suffer. Let me share with you some verses that remind us of this. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29 says, it has been granted to us not only to believe in Jesus Christ, but also to suffer for him. See, it's actually granted to us not only to believe in Jesus Christ, but also to suffer. Belief and suffering for Christ are one and the same thing. Yet you talk to many Christians and it's almost like, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Why are bad things happening to me? Have you not read the Bible? <laughs> How about 2 Timothy 3.12? Now, in fact, all who want to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12. He doesn't say maybe, he says, all of us who are truly wanting to live godly lives in Christ Jesus, we will be persecuted. Not a matter of if, just a matter of when, you see. Jesus himself says, I'm telling you these things so that in me you will have peace in me. In the world that you live in, you will have trouble and suffering, but be of great courage. I have overcome the world. But Jesus never taught his followers, don't be prepared to suffer. He taught them exactly the opposite. And Peter is following up on that because Jesus tried to prepare his disciples and they wouldn't listen to him in the Garden of Gethsemane and they fell flat on their face because they did not arm themselves with the attitude that they should have had that hard times were coming. And if they weren't strong enough, those hard times were going to run them over. And they did. And they got up, they saw, in a sense, the tire tracks on their bodies because they got run over because they weren't ready for what was coming. And God is always trying to prepare his people for what's coming. So Peter, first of all, says, you want to live victoriously in this life? First thing is be prepared to suffer. Don't be surprised when suffering comes. In fact, look over at chapter 4, verse 12. Peter writes later, Dear friends, do not be astonished. Do not be shocked that a trial by fire is occurring among you as though something strange were happening to you. <laughs> and yet again, many Christians, many Christians, when some trial comes into their life, it's like they're shocked. Like, I can't believe it. How, how dare I be going through a trial, you know? I'm a good person, and, and I'm, a, I'm a Christian, and I'm trying to do everything right. And so, we live in a fallen world, right? With fallen people, right? And we still have the old nature, right? This is a broken world. What do we expect? Do we expect not to go through life suffering any kind of pain or discomfort or hardship or loss or... No, we will. And so many people today can't handle it. They can't deal with life 
which is why they turn to all these different substances and coping mechanisms because they can't deal with it because they're not strong enough to deal with it. And God's people should be strong enough to deal with it because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen. Secondly, Peter says, not only be prepared to suffer, but if we want to live victoriously in this life and be a victor, not a victim, be consumed with the will of God. Notice what he says, again, back in chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. Since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same attitude, because the one who has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin, in that he spends the rest of his time on earth concerned about the will of God and not human desires, for the time that has passed was sufficient for you to do what the non-Christians desire. And then he lists some things. I want to direct your attention, first of all, to two phrases from verse 3 and verse 2. First of all, the phrase in verse 3, the time that has passed. Peter's saying, first of all, he's talking to people who maybe lived a pretty significant amount of their life before they even became a Christian. And he's saying, all that time before you became a Christian, that, that's passed, and that was sufficient. Why are you still living that way going after the things that the world goes after since you have become a Christian. That's past. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. All things should be passing away. All things should be coming new. Don't keep living the way the world lives. Live differently. That, But he's also saying this. He's reminding us very soberly and seriously that time past is not something that we can ever get back. Once, our, once those weeks turn into months and turn into years, we can never get that time back. It's gone. And we can never retrieve it, and we can never go back and relive that again. It's gone. Let it go. Don't focus there. Focus here, verse 2, on the rest of the time we have on this earth. Not the time that has passed, but on the rest of our time on earth. And none of us knows how long that is going to be. For some of us, it might be a very short time. For others of us, it might be decades. But the deal is, compared to eternity, it's still a very short time, and we're going to talk about that next week. But Peter is saying, for the rest of the time you and I have left, why are we not consumed about the will of God? Amen. By the way, the will of God is not something that we should run from. You know, many Christians, one of the reasons why they never, like, get to a level of commitment where they just give their whole life to God is because, again, they've got this, this thinking in their heads that if I give my life to God, His will for my life is going to be miserable. It's going to make me miserable, and He's going to ask me to do things that I don't want to do, and it's just the opposite. Because He is our Creator, because he, he actually knows us better than we know ourselves, whatever his will is, is aligned with how he made us, which is why we need to learn who he created us to be. Because our temperament, our talents, our gifts, our abilities, all these things that he made us unique with are also corresponding to the will that he has for us in this life. It actually is a perfectly fitted, uniquely well-fitted responsibility that God wants to give us that fits us like a glove. Amen. It's something that will actually please us. It's actually something that will fulfill us not, like nothing else. It, it's something that will bring joy to us not, like nothing else. So he's saying, why should we not be for the rest of our time, however long that is, however many days, weeks, months, years, God gives us on this earth, let's be consumed with the will of God for our lives. And let me say this. Some of you may be looking big picture and go, well, I don't really know what God's will is for my life. Here's what I would tell you. The best advice I could give you as your pastor is start doing the things that you know in your life are God's will, and that's how you'll find the bigger part of God's will. See, part of where we go wrong as Christians is we want God to give us the big picture first, but we're not willing to do the little things he's already told us to do. Amen. God says, you start doing those things. It's, it's sort of like a parent with a child. 
You want to teach your children responsibility, then they've got to start doing the little things first. You shouldn't hand them something bigger in responsibility if they can't prove they can handle this first. Well, that's the way God is with us. God said, I'm not going to give you this bigger responsibility here until I can see that you can handle these little things over here. So the best way to learn God's will is just by starting to do the things that we already know God wants us to do, and then we'll grow into finding and discovering what those other things are down the road. Be consumed with the will of God. That's a way to live victoriously in this life and not become a victim, but rather a victor. Third, be aware that God has the last word and eternity awaits. Peter says, not only be prepared to suffer, not only be consumed with the will of God, but be aware that God has the last word and eternity awaits. Notice back again in verse 13 of chapter 4, Peter says, after saying, don't be surprised at these trials by fires that you're going through, he says, rejoice. Rejoice in the degree that you've shared in the sufferings of Christ so that when his glory is revealed, when he comes back in all of his glory, you may also rejoice and be glad. By the way, that word rejoice there, the second word there, means to jump for joy. I'd like to be able to do that this morning, but I'd probably hurt myself up here. But he's saying, you realize when, when we are all in for Jesus Christ, that there's coming a day where you and I and following Jesus is going to be vindicated and where God is going to reward his faithful followers and where when he comes back in all his glory, we're not going to be sitting in a corner going, oh, I, I'm so ashamed that I was a follower of Jesus Christ and, and this whole future that God has promised me is so disappointing. Oh, my goodness, when we see him coming on that white horse and we see him, you know, establishing his kingdom on this earth and ruling and reigning as the promised Messiah, we're going to be like, yippee! Thank the Lord I am saved and that I am part of his eternal kingdom. We're going to be jumping for joy. We're going to be jubilant because God has the last word. God has the last word and eternity is awaiting. And Peter is basically saying, yeah, it's hard right now. But what do you think about the future and the destiny of those who just turn their backs and literally run from and reject the love of God and reject the free gift of salvation? What about that? In fact, notice that Peter talks about them because in verse 4, he picks it up saying, look, your unsaved friends especially that you used to hang with, he said they are astonished when they see this change in your life and they don't understand why your life and why you're living it differently from the way you used to. You're not running with them now. You're not running with the same crowds you used to run with. Your priorities are all different and they can't understand it. And it's okay because they can understand it. But that doesn't mean you should stop following Jesus with all your heart. That just means you may have to make a choice between following Jesus or continuing to do with your friends do. And sometimes it's not even your unsafe friends. Time, sometimes it's your uncommitted Christian friends. Sometimes that's the suffering that you and I have to go through. That as we continue to follow hard after Jesus, that means some other relationships get left behind. Because sometimes it's going to come down to, am I going to follow hard after Jesus, or am I going to continue to sort of cater to these group of people over here? And sometimes it's Mutually exclusive. You and I sometimes can't continue to follow after Jesus and yet be really close to these people because their priorities and their values and everything is so different from what a committed Christian's values and priorities should be. And he says, though, notice, they are getting ready to face, verse 5, a reckoning before Jesus Christ who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. Unfortunately, if they continue to go down this road, there's a day of reckoning coming for them. Because again, why? God has the last word. And you and I are going to be so glad, even jumping for joy, that we were on the side of Jesus Christ when that day comes. 
In fact, he even goes a step further. He says in verse 17, it is time for judgment to begin starting with the house of God. And if it starts with us, notice what the question is. What will be the fate of those who are disobedient to the gospel of God? And he sort of lets it hang there. Because we don't want to even think about that. Which, can I say, goes back to one of the messages in Peter is why God wants his people, his church, to be such a dynamic witness in the world in which we live. Because we should care about the eternal destinies and fates of our human fellow human beings. We don't ever want to see them go out into a Christless eternity. We want to see them turn to Christ and experience the abundant life that you and I have. And that means we need to be a strong witness because what will that fate be? I've shared this with you before, and this is a good time to share this again. Here's what Peter is saying in a nutshell. First of all, to the Christian, he's saying, you realize whatever difficulties and hardships and suffering and pain you go through as a Christian, do you realize this is the only hell you will ever know? And to the one who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, whatever good, whatever joy, whatever they can somehow uh, accumulate, what little bit of time they have on this earth, that's the only heaven they will ever know. Peter is saying if you and I want to live victoriously and be a victor, not a victim, let's always keep in mind every day what awaits. Eternity awaits, and God is going to have the last word. Amen. That keeps us from our minds getting to a place that is very unhealthy, especially when we're going through difficult circumstances. Next, Peter says, be at rest in God's supernatural provision and character. Be at rest in God's supernatural provision and character. I love this. Look at verse 14. He says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory, who is the Spirit of God, rests on you. In fact, it means he especially rests on you. In other words, God gives special provision of his spirit to those Christians who are going through difficult times. And I love it when he calls the Spirit of God also the Spirit of glory. Remember the glory of God in the Old Testament? It was called the Shekinah glory that would literally come down and rest upon the tabernacle or lead and guide God's people. It was this spectacular, visible manifestation of the glory of God. I believe it was maybe even what Moses saw when he was in the presence of the burning bush. And God displayed his glory. And God is saying to his people, People, do you not realize that my glory even rests on you when you suffer? Amen. That you have my special supernatural provision and that it is more than enough to get you through whatever you go through if you will rest in it as it rests on you. Amen. God is in us because his spirit is in us. And if God is in us, God is greater than anyone or anything. In fact, John even says, the one who is in us, the Spirit of God, is greater than he who is in the world. Well, that also means he's greater than anyone or anything. God is in us, the Spirit. And when you and I go through hard, difficult, painful circumstances, God promises his supernatural provision that his spirit who lives within us literally will rest on us in a special way. Think of a couple weeks ago, we were looking on Wednesday night at the murder of Stephen from the book of Acts and how this young man, even while he was being stoned, was able to keep his wits about him. Even as he was bleeding and his, as his skull was being crushed by the rocks that were thrown at him and he was still able to, to be coherent and to be able to pray pray and to be able to think of others instead of himself. Even while he was being murdered, he said the same words that Jesus said from the cross, do not lay this sin to their charge, Lord. How could he be in such a place? Because the Spirit of God was literally resting upon Stephen during that time. 
And you and I need to understand and trust and believe that when you and I go through the most difficult circumstances we will go through on earth, that we are promised that the Spirit of God, the glory of God, will literally rest on us in a supernatural, special way. Amen. And God is more than enough for us. But notice Peter also says, I not only want you to rest in the Spirit of God resting on you, I want you to rest in the character of God. Notice what he says in verse 19. So then, let those who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator as they do good. First of all, I want to talk about the word entrust. It is a banking term. It was a term that was used in biblical times for depositing something for safekeeping. What Peter is saying is you and I can deposit all of our our life, our soul, who we are, the things most precious to us, and we can deposit all of that to God, and he's going to keep it safe because no one can watch over it and care for it like God can, including me, including you. That's why he says we can literally entrust our very soul, who God created us to be, to him, because no one can keep it safer than God can. No no one can watch over us like God can. The God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. His eye is always on us. We cannot escape his presence. We can entrust our soul to him. And then he goes on to say, to a faithful creator one who is trustworthy, one who keeps their promises, thereby inspiring confidence. That's what the word faithful means. Basically reminding us everything God promised, everything he's promised, he's come through on. God has never broken a promise that he has made to mankind, never. And he never will, because God cannot lie. God cannot go back on what he said. He is faithful. Therefore, you and I, when we remember how faithful God is and that every promise he's ever shared with us is true and trustworthy and reliable and dependable, then that should inspire more and more confidence in us to just continue to trust him more because he's so faithful. So Peter is saying, you want to live as a victor instead of a victim? Be at rest in God's supernatural provision and character. And then one more this morning. Peter says, I want to prepare you for what's ahead. I want you to live victoriously. I don't want you to get run over by your circumstances like I did at one time in my life. So the final thing Peter shares with us, be in awe of the privilege of following Christ. Be in awe of the privilege of following Christ, of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Notice what he says in verse 16. Well, let me start in verse 15. He says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or the thief or criminal or as a troublemaker, but if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but glorify God. Here it is, that you bear such a name. Glorify God that we bear such... By the way, the word bear means to be connected to. (laughs) The fact that you and I are connected to the name of Jesus Christ. He says that should always bring an awe at the privilege that that is. Do we think about that a lot? Do we even think about that at all, even on a daily basis? That every day you and I wake up, we have the privilege, no matter what suffering comes our way because we're a Christian, that we have the privilege of being connected to the name of Jesus Christ. Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts. Let me show you this fleshed out by a few people in the early church. Acts chapter 5, verses 40 and 41. We were looking at these verses a couple weeks ago on Wednesday night as well in our study of the book of Acts. And it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 40, that the, that the 
political leaders summoned the apostles and had them beaten. Don't, don't just bypass that. When it, when it says that the apostles were beaten, it meant they were beaten. It meant that they would have been bloody from head to toe. It meant that their clothes would have been stained with their own blood. And yet, keep following with me. They had ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, but they released them. And notice the reaction of these who had been beaten because of the name that they were connected to. They left the council rejoicing because they had been considered worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. Amen. Wow. That is a group of people who are in awe every day of the privilege of being connected to the name of Jesus Christ. They understand the magnitude of that privilege and the magnitude and the majesty and the magnificence of the name itself, Jesus. The one that Gabriel came to Joseph and said, I want you to name your son Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. There's a significance to the name of Jesus. Peter, earlier on, when he was going up to the temple, looked at that man who was lame and says to him, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the powerful name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And that man stood up because the name of Jesus carries power with it like no other name. And we know that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved under heaven than the name of Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, because Jesus was willing to be obedient to the will of his Father, even in obedience to the point of suffering on the death of the cross, that his Father gave him a name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee one day will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. There is something about that name. Jesus. And Peter is saying, when you and I live in awe every day of the privilege of being connected to the name of Jesus Christ, we will always be able to live as victors rather than as victims. I'm going to ask you to stand with me now. I don't know what situation or circumstance or season of life you're going through, but I want to direct your attention to what Peter again says in 1 Peter 4.19, what he encourages all of us to entrust our very soul to our faithful Creator, to the one who is absolutely trustworthy because every promise that he's ever given to us, he will come through on. He will never break a promise. And so I pray here today that as we have risen up from our seats, that we will also rise up in our life and that we will not allow any longer our circumstances or our situation or our season that we're going through to define us or to defeat us, but through the Lord to be able to get on top of that circumstance, on top of that season of life, and to realize that, that nothing can defeat me if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm ultimately a victor, and I do not fight for victory. As Christians, we fight from the victory that has already been secured by our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we should stand here today triumphant as overcomers because as Paul said to the Romans, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us in Jesus Christ. Let's be conquerors today, not the conquered. Let's be overcomers today, not those who are being run over. Let's be victorious because we have a faithful creator and we can entrust our very soul to him. We declare to you today, God, 
your faithfulness. May we trust you like never before. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to sing this song of worship as a song of victory, celebration, and declaration today that we serve a faithful God who will be faithful to us throughout our life and throughout eternity. And we have everything we need through our God to be victorious, to be a conqueror, to be an overcomer. Let's sing like we are overcomers today. <laughs>